The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. Let's talk about the most well-known movie to feature homicidal attack penguins and some creepy dude with a sandblasted pockmarked face since Batman Returns. It's Good Luck Chuck. What the fuck? Um. Hey everyone, this is Michael T. Bradley. And I'm J. Wilfred Neville. Whom you might hear me refer to as Ford, because that's how I was introduced. So, we're gonna talk about this movie featuring homicidal penguins and uh, a very sandblasted-looking Dane Cook, as well as Jessica Alba and uh, some other people. And some tits. Many, many tits. Sometimes three at a time. And <laughs> let's first go through a basic plot synopsis. Ford, you want to start us out there? We start out with a seventh grade or something spin the bottle party, and they're playing seven minutes in heaven. And of course, since this entire movie, I think think is Dane Cook's juvenile fantasy wish fulfillment. <laughs> the hot goth girl at the party throws herself at him and he rejects her, for which he gets a curse. Yes, very similar to Beastly, which we've talked about here on the podcast before. Very similar to Beastly, the main character is cursed. This time it is, instead of being ugly, the curse is whenever a woman sleeps with him, the next man that she's with will be her true love. Which wasn't really clear at the time of the administering of the curse, because it was, of right. course, written in rhyming couplet and all mysterious and obtuse. Yes, it was just like, rain shall fall around you, or love shall fall around you like rain never hitting the twain, blah, 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 blah. Probably something about a taint in there, because <laughs> that's the kind of movie this is. Yes. You know, Dane Cook is our lovelorn protagonist who just really wants to be happy and settle down or whatever, and, uh, of course, he's kind of curse to only have sex, especially when people find out about this uh, uh, this curse that's on him. It was a little bit strange to me, given the level of sensitivity displayed elsewhere in the movie, that like they resisted the urge to fall back on the old tired gypsy curse trope. We will talk about the sensitivity as, as much as we can, and I, I am sure that you chose that word very specifically there, rather than saying uh, Romani, saying the pejorative term, uh, because this movie... But first, let's just let's get through the plot. So, uh, And then he finds a girl who he really loves and wants to spend his life with, and so... Wackiness ensues. <laughs> <laughs> right, hijinks ensue, but the... The, uh, uh, you know, the dramatic difficulty of the movie is that he has to find a way to get past being just a lucky charm and, and being a forever man. Let's jump into our what the fuck moments because I think they will give you a taste of what this movie is like. This is, did we actually say the title of the movie? I think so. I think I said it at the beginning. Good luck, Chuck. Yeah, uh, so, at no yes. point in the movie is the main character, Charlie, referred to as Chuck. No one but the title. It actually does Chuck. happen twice in the movie. Twice in the movie he's called Chuck. Once on a phone call where we're on Dane Cook, so the phone call is very... Right. And you can only just barely hear it, and then once later on, once is his best friend calling him that, and that's on the phone call, and I can't remember the second one, but I do remember that uh, just being like, is anybody ever going to call him Chuck? And it does happen twice. I must have completely succeeded finally in sheltering myself and suppressing my memory of this movie at some points and missed those bits because i was looking out for it because like the movie's good luck chuck and they're calling him charlie all throughout so i must have missed those and i really thought why not good time charlie's got the blues considering i but whatever in any case let's go through our what the fuck moments i'm gonna start out this first one needs a little bit of setup i don't know there's no way <laughs> to describe it it's i don't know what the fuck was going on Dane Cook is receiving a blowjob from a woman who is making growling lion noises, and there is a look of discomfiture on his face when those sounds are made that is somewhat horrifying. It's not entirely clear what is supposed to be happening there, because he is sort of like going happy face and then freaking out. Yes, though she does say, I was licking sand off your balls, so I'm assuming there was something blowjobish going yeah, on there. Must have been. My first one is actually during the opening scene, the studded leather training bra. The rest of mine are all lines of dialogue from his best friend in this movie. First one, I jerk off to her mammograms. Throughout the entire film, the music had me going, what the fuck? There were boner sound effects, like boom, 
and there was a flaccid penis sound effect. And there was special music for fat people, which is something we'll get into a little more. And literally a flashback sound that goes... I didn't catch this whole line. It went by very quickly. But what I did catch was knob gobbling flesh devouring. There was a skirt made of tissue paper. The line, I'd suck a fart out of her ass and just inhale it like a bong hit. And, of course, for those of you who stayed around for the closing credits, Dane Cook performing Cunnilingus and Analingus on a stuffed penguin. Yeah. The other thing they do in those end credits is show us the girl with polymastia. They hint that they're going to show it before, and then she pulls up her shirt and it cuts away, and you're like, oh, they didn't go that far, and then the end Which credits... Which is the one time in the movie that they don't show us the tits of the girl involved. Apart from Jessica Alba, obviously, for contractual reasons, I assume. <laughs> You know, bringing up Jessica Alba, let me just say right off the bat, the one thing that I liked about this movie was Jessica Alba. I thought she was charming, sweet, and I just wanted to get her the hell off of the set the entire time that this movie played out because she just did not feel like she belonged here at all. Right. Has she even done anything since then? I get her mixed up with some of those other women in film. W was she in Sin City as a stripper? Oh, she was. Was That that was after this. From those what-the-fuck moments, you can tell that this movie's idea of comedy is maybe not exactly the same as you or me. Like, for instance, when, when I watch an Adam Sandler movie, which has happened maybe twice in my life, it seems to me as if they take a joke and then they take it to its logical extreme and you're like, ah, oh, that's kind of cute and clever, and then he pushes it just further so that you're like, now I hate you. Right. This movie takes it from point A to point Z just immediately. There's no pulling you along the way. And I, I did not realize how much I would miss the Adam Sandler version of taking a joke too far until I watched this goddamn thing. Right. This movie had Adam Sandler going, guys, come on, was that really necessary? And, and the thing that really makes it frustrating is... They try to have their cake and eat it too. Because they try to be both this line-crossing, in-your-face, disgusting, puerile comedy. Yeah. But they, but they also try to give it uh, heart. And the heart is always in the wrong place, and it's it, it, as in not with our main character. And so it becomes disturbing. Because, I mean, our main character, I guess, we're supposed to like because he wants... To be a, you know, he he wants to be committed and blah, 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 blah. Right, it's not his but, fault. It's the curse. Which it's never really clear if the curse is real or not. It seems to be real from the fact that it always happens. But then at the end, the curse comes undone before the witchy woman does anything to take the curse back. And she is even like, I don't know what the hell I did. I just mumbled some mumbo jumbo. Right. So it's like, did the curse exist or not? It's never very clear. And it's after the happy ending that she goes and takes the pin out of his... Uh, voodoo doll's heart so uh, god only knows if there was if the curse was intended to be real or if this was just really a story about someone kind of becoming a man or whatever i i'm just gobstopped by how <laughs> stupid and terrible this movie is in so many ways so so the heart of the movie i want to talk about the heart of the movie very briefly before we get into the horror, the the <laughs> empty abyss that is this movie overall. But the heart, for instance, we have a scene with a girl in a... Uh, this is when Dane Cook is first finding out that people see him. He's called a good luck charm at a wedding of an ex, and he thinks that's a little weird. And then he this, this chick is in the car with him, and she just immediately starts trying to have sex with him. And he's like, whoa, 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 I thought we were just going to dinner. And she explains the curse to him, and he's like, that's crazy. I mean, why would you believe that? And she's like, she gives this heartbreaking little speech, I thought, where it's like, look, you know, you can't imagine how many losers I've dated, how horrible I've been treated, and how desperate I am to find someone who really cares for me. If this has even a point zero zero one percent chance of working, I don't mind having casual sex once, 
and it failing. And I was like, oh my god, like, I was, like, near tears from that little <laughs> scene. And it seemed like, what is this doing in this movie? And, and similarly, Reba, his secretary, which uh, we both wrote down... <laughs> right, sassy, sassy black, black woman. woman. Straight out of central <laughs> casting. Yeah, she comes there, and, and, and we find out she's a widow, and it's, you know, it's difficult being a single mother, a working single mother, and she is like... And it's, of course, played for laughs, because she's a larger black woman, and she, like, fucking breaks a table. And, I mean, Dane Cook should have been in traction by, like, the halfway point of this movie. <laughs> but instead, you know, she's like, look, I, I just, I am really lonely. And uh, if you really have this magic to give in your penis, then that would be awesome. And, and the scene ends somewhat tenderly. But then five minutes later we're in a fucking brady bunch-esque multiple screen shot of dane cook fucking see i honestly read both of those scenes very cynically as is my want which is that like those scenes were there to sort of try to redeem how extremely gross this movie is and how much of just a puerile wish fulfillment fantasy it really is to try to like Otherwise, the main character is basically just completely reprehensible. And the entire premise of the movie and everyone involved in writing, producing, and filming it <laughs> is utterly without redeeming quality. So, like, yeah. I cynically read those scenes as being, especially, like, uh, Reba, his secretary, says, like, you can picture anyone you want. And he says, he, like, touches her on the cheek really sweetly and says, only you. Like, I'm only picturing you or something like that. Like... It's so over-the-top sweet and, like, him behaving as a decent human being, which is completely out of character. They were like, these two scenes make it a date movie, right? Right. I don't know. Like, if you're going to make Freddy Got Fingered, make Freddy Got Fingered. Don't put, like, a sweet schmaltzy scene of Tom Green being like, I'm only picturing you, <laughs> you know? I mean, it just doesn't, it, it doesn't work, right? Which I actually enjoyed, Freddy Got Fingered, I have to say. I, I, I really liked that movie, and a lot of people are shocked by that. But it's like, you can do puerile humor and do it well. This movie is just literally this black amoral abyss of nothingness that dares you to hold on to a shred of humanity once it's done. And and speaking of the Reba scene, this movie hates fat people. Oh, just yeah. hates fat people with a passion. Has so much fat hatred. There, There's one scene, you know, you, you mentioned the word gypsy, which is uh, uh, pejorative and... And, uh, uh, you know, you're supposed to say Romani now or whatever. And I'm, I, I, all the time I still fuck up on that and say, right. uh, uh, you know, Egypt me or whatever. And I'm like, oh shit, I, I that's, uh, there's my racist point for the day or whatever. <laughs> but it's like this, there was a scene where the two doctors, cause he and his best friend, he's a dentist and his best friend's a plastic surgeon are just hanging out in the park, throwing a Frisbee back and forth. Cause that's what doctors do. And in that scene, he says retarded and there's a little jokey section about them mixing up which Indians are which Indians. Right. I was like, how offensive can one single scene get? To be fair, it doesn't necessarily hate fat people. It mostly only hates fat women. That, uh, that's because true. Because Stu, his best friend, is not exactly svelte himself, but that is not really brought up. Like, that's not even an issue throughout the course of the movie. That's true. He does say at one point that it's been forever since he's gotten laid. But that seems to stem more from the fact that he's a complete misogynist. Right. Though they also do play him for laughs, because Dane Cook walks into his house unannounced, and he's masturbating with a grapefruit and... And a dish sponge up his butt. Right, yeah, I was like, I couldn't tell what it was that he had up his ass, but the guy's like, can a man masturbate in his own house in privacy? And I'm like, I'm on Stu's side here. For the only <laughs> time in the entire film, like, I, you know... I, what a consenting adult does with his own produce is his business. That, to me, seemed like it was kind of a little bit of um, uh, fat hatred towards Stu, because obviously if he had walked in on, say, Jessica Alba masturbating with a banana, it would have been hot, right? Right. I wonder if that's the scene that got this movie sold if whoever was reading it was like oh shit american pie made billions let's uh right we got we got somebody fucking a a, 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 a fruit here we let's give this a go green light that bad boy <laughs> <laughs> and then they shot themselves <laughs> with any luck yeah so this movie just seems to hate 
every minority, most of all, I think it hates women. Just all women. Not just overweight women, but all women. Yeah, they are all... Did you notice that except for Reba, the only women out there who want to get married and can't find love are hot women? Right. Except for one thing, which we'll talk about later in more detail, but except for one incident... Every woman who comes to him who wants to fuck him to find her perfect match is, like, fucking Maxim level hot. When they're literally queuing up, like, to come into his dentist office and stuff, it's just, it looks like a casting call for Victoria's Secret show. Yeah. All of the women who want to get married and can't, and, and actually, even if you watch, like, the extras, and it's like, there is no real diversity in level of hotness except in those couple of instances where they want to emphasize very distinctly this woman is not attractive. And the biggest example of that is when he's trying to prove or disprove the curse so that he can have sex with Jessica Alba. He goes for this woman who is extremely large, and of course the first quote-unquote line that she gets is a fart noise. Because that's what fat people do, is fart all the time, that's right? what I do. <laughs> and after that, when he is, like, downing booze, you know, one thing after another at the table, and he, he says, oh, maybe we could get physical, she, of course, becomes ridiculously sexually aggressive. That's another thing that I really hated about this movie. The fact that a sexually aggressive female equals scary and ugly. Right. Like, every woman should just be giggly and cute, like Jessica Alba, I guess. But she also wants to initiate sex. You know, she starts sexting him, and that's driving him crazy or whatever. But it's cute when she does it. Right. I, I remember seeing an article once that was called, uh, It's Not Just Thin Young White Women Who Sexed. <laughs> there were a couple of other moments that really made my toes curl in embarrassment. Like, when he, he has all these voicemails. Of, like, all of these prospective right. women, obviously, who want to sleep with him so that they can find their one true love. And he's going through them, and then, of course, there's one recording of a guy. And he's like, oh, yeah. shit, fuck! I can't skip that message fast enough. And so, like, yeah. that, that you know, throwing a little bit of homophobia oh. for good measure. And I think I know what you're owing about, but I'll let you say it. And also the transphobic moment. Yeah. When he went, yeah, when he's just fucked this chick and she's like, oh, you know, we actually went to high school together. And he's like, oh, I remember a Marlon Gibbs or whatever. Was that your brother? And she says, oh, that was me before the operation, which I was like, this is a damn good operation. Jesus. And that's the extent of the joke, right? That's just the punchline of the joke is there is a transgendered person. That's it. That's the joke. <laughs> I slept with a transgendered person. That's really the punchline is like, oh my God, oh, you got to go throw up now. I'm surprised that there wasn't like a muted trumpet <laughs> right there. Cause it really... That's how subtle the sound was throughout the whole movie too. Even the music and, and not just the score, but the music choices. Did you notice how ridiculously overly appropriate the music choices were like uh the song that they play when he's like i can't sleep with her or else i'll lose her so he pretends to have a really bad cold for weeks and it goes into this montage and the music that plays is i really love it when you call or something like that <laughs> and the the movie starts out with the cars which is always a bad sign <laughs> again though i i cannot stress enough how much this movie hates women and you know I'll, I'll admit the reason that i knew about this movie was because i saw a preview and the preview very much focused on the fact that jessica alba is clumsy in this movie right, right? that's her like defining characteristic her defining trait and they really really beat you over the head with it in the first like three scenes that she is in the the just totally unbelievable big explodey accidents that she gets in and you know eventually having chipping her tooth and having to go into his dentist's office and that's what gets their relationship rolling then of course as the movie progresses she gets less and less clumsy because <laughs> that's how these sort of things operate but in any case i saw that trailer and i actually like i enjoy that sort of like the old style screwball comedies where they did not necessarily put women on a pedestal and you would have, like, you know, bringing up baby. You would have, like, ditzy women as stars, and it was played for comedy, and it was still interesting. And so I thought, oh, they, they did something like that. That's surprising, because Dane Cook is in it. But I guess, right. you know, 
even a stop clock is right twice a day. <laughs> and the first time that I watched it, I think I got maybe 15, 20 minutes into it. And I just, I was like, wow, I'm embarrassed to be a human being uh, and especially embarrassed to be a guy from this movie. Uh, th this is, instead of chemical castration, they should make child molesters watch this film. Over and over and over again. Pry their eyelids right. open like clockwork orange. <laughs> And maybe That's it, intersperse yeah. it with Dane Cook stand-up specials every once in a while. <laughs> Jessica Alba, when she's introduced, like her first scene, she furiously attacks Charles's crotch. Furiously attacks it because something spilled on Hot him. Wax. And it's like she, she dumped a, a burning candle on it. Oh, was that what it was? Yeah. I was totally, I was baffled uh, by what was going on there. And then we have... This, most of them caused by her, we have this kind of cascade of different things that are supposed to be funny. For instance, a dead dove, dental implements stuck into Dane Cook's back, that, like projectile stuck into his back, and then he is electrocuted trying to help jump her car so hard that he flies, right. like 20 feet. Right. And it's like, this is funny, The car has a 10,000 volt battery in it, apparently. <laughs> It's one of those yeah. new hybrid mid-60s convertibles. You know, to Alba's credit, she plays it off very charmingly and very cute, but it's just, it's like, oh dear God, like, this is horrifying. Like, this is, I mean, this is kind of a horror movie, you know? And and instead, <laughs> I think you're supposed to be laughing. And I don't, I don't get the joke. I do not get it at all. Also, it starts out with little kids being sexy. Right. I'm, sexy I'm children. I'm trying to remember if I actually laughed at any point during this movie. Hmm. I may have smiled once or twice, and I'm sure it was always at Jessica Alba, because she she is extremely charming in spite of what's going on all around her. Yeah, she feels woefully out of place here, and I feel so bad that she was in this. It's very, very sad. Um, oh, you know, I think I laughed at her brother, who's that uh, comic and actor who I can't think of his name, but he's he's gotten a lot bigger since he was in this movie. Right. Because he would always have these ridiculously appropriate quotes, even though he's just kind of this idiot stoner kid. Right, except that he apparently talked her into giving Dane Cook's character another try. Yeah. For really it... flimsy reasons. Well, obviously, for the main reason to propel the plot forward. I think he just wanted her to be out of the house more <laughs> so he wouldn't get as much shit for... For being hot out, all the time. Know? Hot. Being high right. all the time. Oh, and there's another point where Dane Cook is, like, viciously attacked by penguins and he's bleeding and it's like, oh, ha, 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 ha. And I mean, I guess, yeah, okay, seeing Dane Cook attacked and viciously is, is kind of amusing, but it really, it was like, he could have died. I mean, that wasn't, like, that wasn't, like, funny. We see that the penguins draw blood. Right. And one of them attacks his crotch, but he's still fucking, like, a goddamn porn star within a day or two. So, like, act two is basically him acting batshit insane to try to keep her. Yeah, that, which was, it, that was the point after which her brother talked her into giving him another try but he like he's exhibiting all of these extremely red flag stalker will follow you home and rape and kill you and bury your body in his basement kind of behaviors a normal person under those circumstances would have been telling his sister go get a restraining order yeah let's go yeah, get you a concealed gun. carry permit yeah that would have been the normal response not like sometimes love is a little bit crazy <laughs> <laughs> Which was basically his sales pitch, right? Yeah, it's it's a it, it does go a little Pacific Heights on us. <laughs> I hate that about rom coms in general, where it's like you know the characters can't just actually talk like adults; they have to do stupid shit because generally some idiot best friend who represents their libido or whatever tells them to do something. And uh, I I also hate the fact that they will act in ways that are close to, you know, thriller suspense movies. And it's okay because they're a comedian. So, you know, like Dane Cook's a comedian. So him sending her 8,000 roses and coming unannounced and blah, 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 Being blah, hiding blah, in that's the backseat of her car when she comes out of work. And, you know, a am I the only one who was like, well, if the curse is that after she breaks up with you, she'll be with her one true love, just don't break up with her. 
and like don't give her a reason to break up with you like right wouldn't that have just been easier it, that i sort of thought that that was the obvious solution and where they were gonna go and of course the other obvious solution is like break up and get back together which maybe is sort of how it went i the narrative is not entirely clear there are a lot of things that aren't really clear like so there's that wedding at the very beginning when the concept of the lucky charm is first introduced and he had just broken up with the girl and she meets the guy at that wedding and the next scene is her in a window in a wedding dress with an engagement ring and i'm like wait i thought this was the next day is this two weeks later is this two years later we just got <laughs> yeah, edited it... to some indeterminate point in the future and because the characters have no arc we can't tell how far in the future we are. And on a similar note, Reba sleeps with him relatively early in the film. And we never, I, I, I think eventually she it's mentioned that she finds someone. Yeah, she says, I met a wonderful man. Yeah, but it feels as if that comes like months later. And it's like, okay, so what is the time frame on this? Right. They don't really give us any clear indication of the passage of time throughout the course of the movie. It may have all happened over the course of a couple of days. In which case, given the amount of sex that he was having, he's probably quite dehydrated and really needs <laughs> yeah. some electrolytes. Did he write this movie? No, no. It was just somebody I'd never heard of. Hmm. I don't, and I don't know if it was written for him or not, but it certainly feels as if they wanted Dane Cook, Tom Green, you know, somebody that sort of shock humor, right? right. Dane Cook kind of looked like a 65-year-old Harrison Ford at times in this film. <laughs> did, did you get that too? Like his face, he just looks really old whenever they put him in close-up, and I don't know why that is. I think that he is actually an escaped mummy. <laughs> That could be. Did you notice, and, and maybe I'm just projecting here, but I think he tried really, really hard to come across as Will Ferrell. Is that a good thing? I, it's not a good thing for me, <laughs> but, but Will Ferrell was a successful comedic leading man at the time, right? I mean, I guess he still is, but I don't think he does. I mean, I think now he just focuses on funny or die for the most part. But at the time, he did uh, a lot of successful comedic movies, and I really felt like Dane Cook was trying to emulate... You know, like, especially when he's doing the acting crazy stuff, it felt like he was doing his impression of Will Ferrell rather than an actual, like, trying to find some sort of heart to this oh, character. Oh, right, like when he pops out of the present in, in the penguin costume. Yeah, and he's like, do you want to, I should, or I could go. Trying to, you know, yeah, then, trying to capture that sort of mumbling, bumbling, awkward type of behavior, which doesn't really suit him at all. Yeah, to me, that, that struck me as very Will Ferrell wannabe. Right. I think the thing that we have to talk about in this movie, and the thing that I could have forgiven, I think, the movie of almost everything, I could have given them the benefit of the doubt and been like, you know, no, there's some scenes with heart. They, they really were just kind of trying to push the envelope and be silly boys and blah, 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 blah. But his best friend is so god-awful, unlikable disgusting and just ruins right any sort of heart that the movie might have i think and i just kept thinking to myself and i even wrote it down here at one point why is he friends with this guy i actually my notes say why is he friends with this shithead <laughs> 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 Is it, you know, all roads lead to Rome. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, it seems like this character is supposed to be sort of a straw man, right? Like, they're trying to paint a picture of misogyny so that they can show that misogyny is bad. But it sort of feels like he's pretty much speaking for the filmmakers most of the time. Yeah. It, it seems like... And he's their inner monologue, like what's actually going on inside their heads. And they're just trying to vilify that by creating him like that. But then they don't really do that. They don't really make it obvious that the attitudes that he's expressing are bad ones. And that people who say these kinds of things are people to be avoided and <laughs> to be shunned and and i just i don't understand why charlie is friends with him i mean charlie seems like he has the possibility of being a likable guy if he weren't dane cook and <laughs> it, it it for some reason he just keeps being friends with this guy even after the whole fucking forcing himself to fuck this disgusting fat woman right and then like the way to prove that the curse doesn't work is his best friend Stu needs to go and try to date her. And as long as they don't marry, 
or, you know, as long as they don't hit it off, then things are fine. And it's like, instead, uh, the guy just lies to him and allows him to go have sex and possibly fuck over his life forever. And it's like, what does he do? He says, you have to rip up your friend card. And it's like, no, never call him again. Right. You know? Yeah, there was also the point where he pries his little dentist placard off of the front of his practice and tapes it to the front of his plastic surgery practice and is pretending to be him basically so that he can sleep with these poor lonely desperate but somehow improbably hot women who are coming and trying to sleep with him in order to get married but there's also the fact that one of those women is in his office when this ruse is revealed and she doesn't notice that for some reason this dentist's office has large like four foot high blow up backlit pictures of breasts naked breasts all over the walls in general women don't understand how anything works in this movie right it, it's like cars I'm, I'm trying to think of all the things that jessica alba interacts with where she just obviously shows, like, the understanding of a four-year-old. And, and and just mostly women in general are, you know, it's like, uh, they, they are just vapid holes to be filled. Even Jessica Alba herself. I mean, she, she, of course, is enjoyable in the movie, but it doesn't really have anything to do with the movie. Because as far as the movie is concerned, she's just a pretty girl. She's really into penguins, and it's not because she has a thirst for knowledge or is really into zoology, and evidently in order to have the job that she has where she's like the aquarium manager at SeaWorld knockoff world or whatever it is, right. like she must have an advanced college degree, but she's never treated like she's an intelligent person worthy of respect. She's just a pretty girl who's really into penguins, and you can tell because her bedroom is full of stuffed plush penguins and she has penguins on her panties. Of which we are treated to a close-up, of course, in the whole tissue paper skirt incident, which was in the trailer. Yes, and it was like, I mean, the selling point there was not, I think, meant to be Jessica Alba is flighty and silly and you want to be her boyfriend because of that. It is, oh shit, you might get to see Jessica Alba's bush or something. Right. The ending, though... Did you think, because, you know, you were saying they were kind of setting him up as a straw man, like he is the actual misogynist. The movie itself is not misogynist. He, Stu is. Right. And that's the, that's the kind of, you know, look, that's the uh, magician's trick. Look over here and don't see over here. Did you notice that at the end of the movie, he actually has the same arc as Dane Cook? Because he's teasing Dane Cook earlier in the film about what do you mean it's her flaws that make her beautiful you know he's like that's stupid you're you're an idiot you should be fucking hot chicks because that's the only ones out there who want to get married and then at the end he falls for a woman with three breasts who had low self-esteem and always saw them as a flaw until he came along i i don't <laughs> I'm not saying it's good, and I'm not saying it's... I'm not saying it works, but I think that's what they were going for. Ah, uh, that, that he learned a lesson, too. Right. While at the same time still, like, being utterly gross, because, like, her big flaw is that she has an extra breast. Right, polymastia. Which is the only thing that he cares about in women at all. Which I just... I, I remember when I watched the movie, I think that was, like you know, kind of like three strikes you're out with the movie. And the first big strike was a plastic surgeon who really, really, really likes tits. I mean, like, that's just so ridiculous because a plastic surgeon isn't just dealing with hot chicks who want bigger tits all day, right. you know? You know, it's kind of like that joke about being a gynecologist. And it's like, well, being a gynecologist, like seven tenths of your day is going to be dealing with problematic vaginas you know <laughs> right i would imagine that if you were either a, a straight male gynecologist or a gay female gynecologist or a, a, a bi whatever gynecologist then then the last thing that you would want to do at the end of the day would be interact with a vagina you know <laughs> it's like if you're a chef you don't exactly want to come home and cook Un unless you're maybe trying something out for work you know i mean that's that's what I see like gynecologist with his wife, you know, like <laughs> I gotta uh, try something you know. out for work, honey. <laughs> <laughs> if you move your legs this way, does that hurt more? How much access just, can I get? We here? just got in this new speculum. <laughs> 
What do you think? Is this cold? I don't think this is cold. <laughs> People keep saying these are cold. Yeah, it's like, I just, I thought that was such a cheesy, stupid thing. And the fact that he's putting fucking tongue depressors on tits and being like, look at how straight they are. Are these even, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it just, it, it was such a, it was such a stupid joke that I couldn't even give the movie that much credit. It feels like there was a bit of a heart here somewhere that just had all of this little boy shit on top of it. Well, I struggled to believe that either one of them actually made it through medical or dental school. That's true, too. Yeah, they are both... I, I mean, Dane Cook, maybe, but yeah, Stu, seriously, I can't... I cannot buy it. I think it would have made more sense if he was, say, the receptionist at a plastic surgeon's place and just always leering at the women or something, right? right? But instead, he's got to be a doctor because I, I don't know. I don't know the reasoning behind it. What one thing do you think could have been changed to make this movie, if not an instant classic, at least a lot better? Oh, that's a difficult question. I guess actually just completely change out that best friend character. Like, replace that best friend character with someone, one, not morally reprehensible, and two, with some diversity, some ethnic diversity. Like, a not-white, <laughs> non-guy who is not a horrible troll. And I think, other than that, like the rest of the movie... You know, you could actually have a, a kind of, um, uh, maybe an interesting twist there would be, if, if you made the best friend character like a kind of geeky girl... And, and had her, you know, like, have kind of a tense moment where she's, like, torn, like, maybe maybe we should sleep together because I'm lonely all the time and nobody gets me. And then you have, you know, the kind of tension there. Although, with this movie, they just would have fucked. I mean, there's no real tension to it, you know, because he is fucking John Holmes' power hammer coxman here. If we get to imagine a totally different movie, then yeah, because that would also have given you the opportunity to sort of turn that trope on its head, right? Of the nerdy girl best friend who is ultimately revealed to be super hot because she yeah. takes off her glasses and lets her hair down and suddenly you realize, <laughs> oh my god, she was hot the whole time. <laughs> Yeah, that would have been good, like a quiet, nerdy girl who was also really witty and like actually had some some reason that you would believe that any person in the world would be friends with them. I'm going to say the same thing as you, except she's introduced maybe 20 minutes into the film, and the first 20 minutes are the same, except we also get a scene in which he murders Stu and hides the body, <laughs> and he's just never spoken of again. And it's, it's like a vicious, brutal ice pick murder where we see, like, s skull fragments flying out of his eye socket. I think that's how I would improve the movie. Yeah, that definitely would have improved the movie for me. In fact, if they made a sequel that was just, like, 12 minutes long, I would pay $12 to see that movie. <laughs> and then during the end credits, we get Will Ferrell... Uh, or not Will Ferrell, Dane Cook actually sticking his penis <laughs> inside a ripped open penguin toy. Yes. <laughs> that that, th I would, that I, part of it actually, like when we were watching that, that supposed home movie during the closing credits of the movie, and you know, it was Stu and his girlfriend watching the movie, I kept expecting Dane Cook's character to then go, haha, I knew you were going to look around my house, so I made this fake video. I definitely did too, but it just kept going right, on. Right, it was... It was real, and they you can tell they legitimately thought it was funny. Like, they thought they were saving the very best part for last. You can even tell Jessica Alba, like, doing the ADR there was kind of embarrassed. Because <laughs> she's like, oh yeah, you like that, don't yeah, you? Oh, so hot. Yeah. Mm. Oh, man. Can I collect my paycheck right. now? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you have any questions or comments, write in to... <laughs> Info at iceonmars.net. Uh, <laughs> but for now, this is Michael T. Bradley. And J. Wilford Neville, a.k.a. Ford. <laughs> and I'm going to go perform analingus on a stuffed penguin. Good night, everybody. You have been listening to Ice on Mars. <laughs>